You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear. Thanks for tuning in to Stagger Cast. Uh, we're down here at Isaac's house in uh, Tinmouth, Vermont. Um, and this podcast is new. We're rolling with it. Um, we got a lot of exciting stuff coming for you. Um, and kind of want to dive in here and just talk about the idea behind the podcast uh, before we dive into the stories and all the fun stuff. Um, kind of what the plan is with Staggercast is we want to talk to guys all across the Northeast, uh, trackers and hunters, uh, some of the more known guys that you probably see in, on social media and YouTube. And we also want to mix in some guys that maybe don't have as much notoriety or don't use social media or YouTube, stuff like that. Um, cause those guys are just as good a hunters. You just, you don't hear as much. And there's a lot to learn from the people that you don't, you don't see on YouTube and stuff. So that's what our plan is with that. Um, and kind of leading into that, if, if you guys want to hear somebody specific, if you want to, um, want us to talk about some certain stuff or want to he- see or, or hear certain stuff, let us know. Like you can reach out to us on Instagram. Uh, it's just at staggercast. You can reach out to us on Facebook, staggercast, or you can get us on the website. It's www.staggercast.com. Um, we're all ears. We want to bring you guys the best content we can. Um, I know we're going to learn along the way and we hope you guys can learn along the way as well. So, um, kind of to give you a little intro to myself and Isaac, uh, I'm from central Vermont. I hunt a lot of the green mountains and I also hunt, uh, Maine, uh, I love tracking. I've been tracking for probably, oh, it's been, I think I started solely tracking in like 2014, I believe it was where if there was snow I was hunting on, I was tracking, um, and kind of learn from there, soaked up every, every bit of podcast reading video I could learn, taught myself, experienced a lot of stuff out in the woods. And that's kind of where I am today. Um, but yeah, what about you? I mean, I'll turn it over to you, kind of give a little brief introduction on yourself. Uh, yeah, my name is Isaac Young and, uh, I'm a deer tracker from Timoth, Vermont. I fell in <laughs> love with it about 10 years ago and that's pretty much all I want to do. Let me preface it. Isaac is the guy that kills uh, a once in a lifetime buck every year lately. So. Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> From New Hampshire to Mass. Um, if you haven't seen Isaac on YouTube, look him up because he's got a lot of great content on there. Um, stuff you can learn from everything from self filming to actual deer tips and, and just seeing some, some awesome kill shots and all that stuff. So tune into that. Um, anything else to add for yourself? I think that you. No, I think let's jump it. right into it. Yeah, let's jump right into it and kind of get into the fun stuff. I first want to talk to Isaac about his. 2021 mass buck if you didn't see isaac's video on youtube you're going to want to check that out we can put the description to his youtube uh in the description of this um uh of this podcast so kind of break us down on that so um it was the second day that i had hunted massachusetts this year and uh we had some snow that we actually weren't planning on getting we thought it was going to be a bare ground day and uh we headed down for an area that we just kind of picked randomly on the map on Onyx and uh, a state piece. And uh, when we got there, it was me and three of my or two of my buddies. We did like a, a couple miles each just looking for a track or some sign. Um, and we just didn't find anything. So we regrouped and headed for a new piece. And on that new piece we all spread out again and i ended up cutting a a pretty good buck track hauled it and uh ended up grunting it back on crunchy snow that so that was a new piece that you never hunted before you said right never hunted usually you you have like a main area you hunt down there or you just kind of bounce around just bounce around yep just bounce around Hmm. and is there good snow that day was it no it was pretty crunchy it was um about an inch and a half two inches of mealy crunchy frozen crap really so but, you were working that track and you, you jumped on it was, yeah so initially i didn't explain it real good off off the get-go but um i actually jumped him with three does and uh there was no tracks in there at all they were just bedded on a, a little hemlock ridge i jumped them and that's when i found their tracks uh, i didn't hear them go or anything they must have heard me coming from a long ways away and um uh, when i went and sorted out the tracks i could tell there was a pretty good buck and um, three does and the buck actually split off from the does and that was my first clue to that he was a good one because it seems like usually the big bucks don't like to be grouped up after you jump them mm-hmm. even you know when you have one buck with a doe it seems like they'll split off um, it's just something the bigger ones do mm-hmm. 
and um, his track wasn't phenomenal, but he did have pretty good stagger. <laughs> hey. um, but um, he he just walked through the woods with I, I don't know how to describe it other than like attitude. I guess you could call it king of the hill, king of the hill yeah. kind of stuff. And um, you kind of have to look into the track a little more down in that neck of the woods just because they don't have the feet like they do up north. Yeah. So you kind of have to, it's kind of a guessing game, but uh, in the video, I say a couple times, I think it's a, a pretty good one, mm-hmm. and it was. So when you but, when you jumped him with the doe, you didn't see you didn't see him then. No, you, did you not? You didn't even see tails or nothing like nope, that. Nope, didn't even hear him go. Okay, you just saw the beds and all. the Just saw the out. beds and saw the and actually, uh, they walked out of their beds. Really? Yep, they okay. walked out of their beds for probably a hundred yards. And then, and then they started through. running. Gotcha. Then they started running. And the snow stopped in the night before, so it, yep. it was a fresh snow. So it was a they, fresh snow. So you knew it wasn't too. Mm-hmm. Huh. Nobody really thought we were going to get any snow either. It was it was kind of a fluke thing. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So those does split. They start going down. Uh, they kind of went out parallel on the ridge. And he went the opposite way. He went the opposite way on the ridge. So you got on his track and mm-hmm. just follow. How far did you follow his track for? Well, initially what I did was I... Um, I knew I had to give him a bunch of time mm-hmm. to to kind of calm down or whatnot and forget about me. Um, so I followed the doe's tracks for a little ways, a couple hundred yards, yep. just to see what they were doing. Um, I tend to do that just because I have uh, squirrel brain. Oh, yeah. I can't, no, I, feel uh, <laughs> I can't sit still for more than about 35 seconds in the woods. Yep. So no, I feel you. I, uh, I went on the doe's tracks and just kind of checked some country out and then – turned back around, came back to the buck track, and got on him then. Yeah. It was probably 45 minutes, an hour yeah. after I initially okay. jumped him. a lot of time then. No I like to do that. Yeah. I like to Just give let him, him calm right down. Yeah, a lot of guys will say half an hour. I think the more the better. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it makes sense. Let's yeah. calm down. That's great. So those does took you kind of parallel. What were they doing after? Yeah, they headed north. He headed south. Okay. Uh, they stopped running almost instantly and kept started feeding again and kind of – Yeah just doing what they were doing they weren't super i I didn't scare them too bad yeah Um, they heard me coming up the hill because it was like walking on cornflakes but yeah so when you turn back you got off those does turn back gave him an hour went up his track what was he was he did he heading cross country fast or yeah he he ran he ran for a long time probably half a mile really yeah he he ran he ran for and uphill slightly the whole way but uh then he stopped and waited for me for a long time probably who knows how long half an hour 40 minutes whatever mm-hmm. and uh but then he went about his business really just and, was and he, he just, feeding or was he just kind of just cruising just cruising around, around just looking yeah. probably looking for another doe he wasn't like looping back towards those other does not yet not yet gotcha. and uh, when i shot him i'm pretty sure i grunted him back but he could have been turned back around headed for those does too really? I, i'll never know so for you, sure. But. So did you? So you were working up his track, mm-hmm. and then you just stopped and grunted, or were you kind of just walking and grunting? I was walking and you were grunting. walking and grunting, and, and then I saw heard, him coming back. I heard him? something, so I stopped, and that's when I saw his rack coming through the beaches, and <laughs> he just ran by me at like thirty yards. I got him to stop. He was going pretty quick. He was trucking back. He was trucking back. Yeah. And so, either one of the two things, I either grunted him back, or he was headed back for those does. But he had no idea you were. I sent. Not until I yelled at him. Yeah, yeah. I'm mapped him uh-huh. and he you know Stop he right stopped there. he put the brakes on like you could tell he i say because like in the that. video you see you, you're following it, you're following it, and then he like stops and then mm-hmm. it looks, is he in like hemlocks right there is that yeah he was in some hemlocks i had a probably like a five foot window that mm-hmm. i wanted him to stop in and he actually stopped just shy of that yeah so he stopped in like a two foot window and all I had was the back of his rib cage, yep. so I put the bead. You got to shoot. I put the bead on the back of his rib cage and let him have it, and he I, it actually dropped him. And you saw you saw the rack of that before that you saw the rack. Oh yeah, you, I said he was headed. Yeah, you knew he was a giant. Though. I knew he was a giant. That's why I completely <laughs> lost it, and uh, it was pretty overwhelming because <laughs> I, it was supposed to be the last day I could hunt this year. My yep. boss ended up giving me one more day after that, but. I mean, it was the last day I could hunt, and the biggest buck I've ever seen in my life I'm, it just fell over in front of me at 30 yards you know it's it's kind of <laughs> one of those overwhelming feelings oh, 100%. hard to explain freaking, I, when i saw the picture later that day on instagram i think it was on your buddy connor's story there or whatever yeah i was like oh my god like you don't see deer like that i mean it's just crazy how massachusetts grows them differently compared to like 
It's crazy. From, I mean, it's the racks. I mean, you see some big racks in New Hampshire and stuff too, but it's just crazy down Massachusetts way. Yeah, it's unbelievable. The racks they grow down there. It's. I wish we had some of that up around here. It's but just, like the character on too, just thick and they got like all those extra stickers and like gnarly bases. It's crazy. I think lack of winters has a lot to do with uh, good antler growth, and the amount of feed that they have is also a lot better than. A lot of a lot of acorn, right, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, a lot of acorn. Yeah, that'll, that'll help. I don't know. It's closer to the ocean. It seems like the closer you get to the ocean, bigger the horns are getting. It bigger the horns are getting in yeah. the northeast. I don't know why. Yeah, but I think it's something to that. It's just it's pretty crazy the difference between states. How like I mean, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Maine, they're all so close. But it's like every state has like a different. It's it's weird how different the genetics are state to state. Yeah, so when you come up Vermont ways. And like we were talking about earlier, like 100, 110 inch bucks, like you're doing something good. That's you a magnum them every year. That's a magnum. 110 yeah. in Vermont is a magnum. For That's sure. And then you go to New Hampshire and you see a buck like the one you got last year. And it's just the, the difference in horn genetics. I'm not saying Vermont doesn't have giant ones or nothing like that, but just the difference between the states is crazy. Right. Which, yeah, kind, which kind of leads like, what what is it that you look for when you're hunting mass and stuff like that? What is it that you're looking for compared to like Vermont? Uh, I'm just looking for places where I can get away from people. Okay. That's pretty much my number one thing, like, anywhere I hunt. I'm trying to get away from people because that's where I know bucks will get the age. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a lot more pressure, would you say, in, like, mass compared to up this way, or is it? Uh, yeah, there's there's quite a bit of pressure, I think, but I don't think there's a lot of guys tracking. Okay. I think there's some. A lot there's of some guys poking around and yeah, stuff A lot like of tree that. stand sitting, okay, which there's gotcha. nothing wrong with no, that. No, absolutely I mean, not. absolutely, you do what you want to do. 100%. I think, uh, but – there's not a lot of woodsmen like there is up this way. Okay. So I, it's, yep. um, you know, it's, but you, you also got to change it up though, because you're not looking for a big four finger track down there. Uh-huh. If you're looking for a big four finger track in Massachusetts, you might go your yeah, you the might whole go life on, and never I'll find say, one Yeah, because they just don't get feet like that mm-hmm. very it's often anyway. Genetic strain of them down there. I mean, it's like up in Vermont, you don't see it. There's not, it's harder to find a four finger track versus like up in Maine. It's so true. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I go in Vermont. If I put a hundred miles on in the national forest, I might find one four finger track. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's like maybe this year I, I, in Vermont, I tracked a buck. It was the first weekend way up high and it was a big one. It was like the only four finger track I saw all year and never caught up to it. I think went and went, but, um, you don't see a lot of them no. versus the ones you, you typically get to chase around, you know, it's funny finger. too. It, but the ones that you do find in Vermont, you really remember them. Oh, 100%, yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's rare. It's, you, yeah. you don't see a lot of them. So when you, you get you get excited about it. You're like, wow, there's a, a giant up in this piece. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, no, I'll have to check out Mass. I never hunted Mass like you. You've been, what, the last three, four years down there, right? Uh, yeah, and I, I went a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, like 10 years ago. I went down with my dad and one of his buddies. Um, we went down there, and I shot a, a small buck down there when I was probably 15 or 16, something like okay. that. So you, you've been down there before. Been going down there for quite a few years, yeah. Same thing, like, up in the mountains? Is that where you're hunting when you started down there? So you've been, yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yep. The Berkshires. Yeah. Those, what are those mountains like compared to here? Is it, like, are they mm. more rolling and kind of softer tops, or is it more steeper? Like They're a lot like the Taconics. Okay. So, yep. like, basically the area that I live in, kind of, like, yep. up through, um, you know, uh, basically the western side of Vermont mm-hmm. all the way up to like Champlain they're kind of they're very steep mm-hmm. uh, a lot of rocks big rocks um you know but it seems to be a lot more oak down there a lot yeah. of oak and hemlock yeah but a lot more feed they grow those things yep not a lot of spruce no not much no, spruce. Not, there's, not, a, there's not a lot of green growth tops up there which no. is like every mountain up this way it's all green growth top which is usually where you end up finding those bigger ones yep exactly so Adam, where's your uh, where's your favorite spot to cut a buck track in the Green Mountains? So I mean, I hunt a lot of the higher elevation stuff up in the northern part of the state, um, and kind of I guess some areas. I mean, like a lot of guys, everybody has their areas where they can kind of go and cut a buck track. Whether you're up in Maine, you kind of swing around some signposts and stuff like that. But kind of what I look for um, in the Green Mountains itself is uh, I look for shelves up high. So, I mean, a lot of people know in Vermont, the mountains kind of like they're steep and then they shelve out, steep and then they shelve out. So what I do in the morning, I, I, I grab on a hiking trail down low, put the gun on the back and start kind of trucking up the mountain. And I got a few shelves up high, like north of 2,600-ish feet, um, where there's always some scrape lines and rub lines and stuff like that. And then if I usually don't get a track on that 
lower stuff and the shelves and stuff where the, all the scrapes are, I'll truck up even higher. And kind of right around that three th- 2,800 to 3,000, you kind of get in that green growth stuff, the stuff that's thicker than hell. And it seems like in Vermont, a lot of those bigger deer, bigger than average deer, will hang up in that green growth for a bulk of their life. I don't know if you experience the same type of stuff. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's crazy when you get up in that green growth and you like get on a buck track, um, like the trail, like you think you, when you see it, it's thicker than hell. Mm-hmm. But like when you get in there and start following a buck around, it's, it, they got mazes through it. And, absolutely. Like, like crossroads where you like, ha- they know everything. So like, that's one of the, mm-hmm. the coolest parts of tracking a buck up high is how they show you how they navigate around the mountains and like how thick it is and how they get through it with me, like with good sets of horns they're getting through that mm-hmm. stuff. Um, so like I said, if I can't cut a track down low on those shelves, I'll, I'll shoot up high into that green growth stuff. And usually you can pick a buck, buck track up, up there. Um, and then from there it's, it's game on. I got a quick point on that. You just, uh, something you said made me think of, I've seen a lot of guys talk about how if a buck walks through tight spruces or in between trees, uh, that they'll leave the track because they think the deer doesn't have a tight rack or it doesn't have a big rack. And I'll tell you from experience multiple times that a big old wide buck went through a gap about eight inches wide. Mm -hmm. They can work their head through stuff like you wouldn't believe. I mean, that one I shot in New Hampshire last year was, um, I think 24 and a quarter inside. And he was going, and he was, he was going through Jack furs. Like you read about in field and stream magazine. Like Mm -hmm. they, you were pushing sideways through them. Really? So, I mean, I think, uh, a lot of guys maybe would talk on that because it it's romantic. It mm-hmm. sounds good, mm-hmm. but I'll tell you right now, a big buck can work his way through. I mean, they, anything they can tip their heads just like you and I can. Tip That's what I'm saying. Head. Yeah, and do not leave a track if I mean, they go through. <laughs> yeah, no, it's worth worth looking. At. I mean, sometimes yeah. you'll see that where maybe a buck will kick a leg out to go around a, a, a gap, but like you said, they can go through that stuff. They just um, go through it, I and mean, all you gotta do is twist your head around it and they're through. If they're on a mission, they're going to go through it. Um, you yeah. know, I, th- I think a lot of guys are intimidated to hunt in the spruces just because of the one one thing is it takes a lot of gumption to get up in there. Mm-hmm. You know, so you work your butt off, sweating, climbing up this big old mountain, and mm-hmm. then your hunt starts then. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys, I think, are intimidated by, oh, there's no deer up here. They don't live up. They're up they're there, up man. There. That's, That's where the big ones are. Yeah, they're hiding and, out And – uh, I've always kind of said that the the mountains in the Northeast, if you look at them to hunt, look at them like they're hollow. Basically, you'll find bucks on top, you'll find bucks on the bottom in the swamps. Mm -hmm. But pretty much in between the top and the bottom, that's nighttime cruising stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll find one with a hot doe in the rut, but... Mm -hmm. They're usually down low in the swamps or up top in the spruces. Yeah, like a lot of the mountains that I hunt, like you'll see the bucks will come down at night and then you'll catch track when you're going up in the morning and you'll see them cutting through that that mid-range stuff. Yep, absolutely. Getting back up there during the day. It seems like in Vermont a lot, for me at least, those bucks, during the day, they're up in that stuff. That's where they want to be. Right. Unless, I mean, it's the heat of the rut, you're going to, I mean, there's going to be some outliers where they're chasing does. Yeah, it's all situational. It can be one halfway up a mountain, whatever, on a doe. But it, it just seems to be that they're usually on top or down on the bottom in a swamp. For is there sure. a lot of swamps up where you hunt in Vermont? Uh, I mean, there's some swamps, but not not like it is down this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, mean, I mean, like in the valleys and stuff, you'll see some swamps. But it's a lot of – up where I am up in northern Vermont, there's a lot more. I mean, I'm not in the northeast kingdom. I'm more like central northern. Right. Um, kind of in the Mansfield range. So there's not a ton of swamps. It's a lot of hardwoods, but a lot of green growth tops. And like – talking about how the deer live up there the first the second day of the season here in vermont we had snow but it was only a pie like down the parking lot i think it's like 1200 feet down there there was no snow so i trucked it up to the top of the mountain and i and i get on a buck track it was like 3200 feet or something and that buck never dropped below 3000 feet that whole day did followed him for nine and a half miles literally like the whole rim of the upper part of the mountain and that buck never stopped. He was looking for does up there, but he was not coming down. Like I was like, I'm going to lose this buck. He's going to drop low maybe, and he's going to go down. There was no snow. But I followed that buck nine and a half miles. He laid like three scrapes down, rubbed a few trees, but like nonstop, just never dropped below 3,000 feet. Going through all that tight stuff, I mean, he had he was rubbing some thick trees, like right. as thick as your leg. And he was a good one. That stuff. Oh, a, a good, good one. one. Yeah, that yeah. was, was kind of like we were talking about before with the four-finger tracks. That was that buck. And he was up high. He, he was wasn't coming four, down. Four, yeah. four finger home dinger. That's, like, <laughs> that's a big one. He had no interest in coming down, which is pretty cool to see. I mean, it, when you're up in that green growth stuff, you feel like you're in it all the time. Oh, you know? absolutely. You are. You're, it's, you are It's in quiet it. up there. You yeah. creep in. It's, it's quiet walking. 
it's just cool to be up there because you, you don't spend a lot of a lot of time up Absolutely. there. Absolutely, but those bucks, man, they do they do live up there. And you said it right there. That's why the big bucks are there is because people don't spend any time yeah. up there. Nobody. And a big buck is going to go where people don't. Hundred percent. That's it. Hundred percent. And that's that's what you need to figure out. You know, it's like if you're going to hunt a piece, where are ninety percent of the guys mm-hmm. not wanting to go. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to put the gun on the back early in the morning and, and shoot and three miles up the mountain. That, no. I mean, some people do. If you, if you do, like, more power to you. Like, that's Absolutely. awesome. Go ahead and do it because you're going to find deer up there. And it's no secret. No, people, it's no secret. People know that the big ones are up there. It's just getting up there. And that's what kind of makes tracking spe- special, you know? Absolutely. I mean, if you're willing to put in the work and have the mindset, like, I'm going to go up to the top of that mountain. Win or lose, yeah. I might not ever cut a track today. But if I'm yeah. going to go up there, it's it's a law average. It's going to pay out. And you're eventually going to get a track, and it's going to be a good one because that's where – they typically hang in Vermont. I mean, it varies state to state. Like when I hunt in Maine, yes, you can you can cut good tracks in the road and stuff like that. Don't get yep. me wrong. Um, but when you're up there, it, it all varies because there's a lot more cutting up there. Yeah. So those deer are actively coming down, checking does in the cuts, feeding in the cuts. I mean, it's all state to state. Which, I mean, you hunt New Hampshire more than I do. What's it like? Because I feel like New Hampshire is more of like a blend of like you got the White Mountains, which are like big, right hardwood ridges and, right. and stuff like that i mean there is green growth and stuff obviously and some cutting but like would you say it's like a in between of like vermont and maine as I, far as that goes <clears throat> honestly i think new hampshire is a lot like maine really yep i think uh connecticut river is the big divide that's the that's the big divide because you get east of the connecticut river and you're finding a lot bigger racks mm-hmm. a lot bigger bodies mm-hmm. you know there are exceptions in vermont there's big deer mm-hmm. uh you know there was a big uh booner shot last year in vermont uh, oh, 177 inch giant. net that was what down south southern vermont right no that was uh bethel i believe oh, okay yeah I'm pretty I know yep. sure yep. um and i mean that's kind of a big buck area always has been yeah. but i don't know why the connecticut river is such a divide but i mean i think so this might be totally be made up in my head but this is kind of a theory that i have and i've noticed it hunting the different mountains the green mountains i'm pretty sure are a lot older than the white mountains are so are the nutrients in the soil in the green mountains depleted Hmm. thousands of years more than the white mountains so is the the green growth is the browse is that full of more nutrients maybe because i just Hmm. feel like that's an interesting take. It's literally you go on the Vermont side of the Connecticut, and a 115 inch buck is a magnum. Oh, for sure. You go on the New New Hampshire side of the Connecticut River, and they shoot booners mm-hmm. every year, mm-hmm. just across the river. Just across the river. Mm-hmm. That's weird. It is. That's real weird. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Hey, a quick word about Stagger Gear. We're a new company coming out this year that's making products specifically designed for hunting and tracking in the Northeast. Um, we got some sweet, innovative products that are built with Big Woods heritage, but have some some modern twists and, and tweaks to them that are really going to give you an advantage out there. So you can check us out on Instagram or Facebook, or you can go on our website, www.staggergear.com. See you out there. How old of a buck track will you take? As far as like the how filled in it is, how old it looks, are you? Yeah, it really depends on how the season's going. I mean, a lot of it comes down to knowing when that snow stopped the night before. So, like, if it's right. a fresh snowfall, I mean, obviously, I want to find one that's not super filled in. But I know yep. if it stops snowing at five a.m. and it snowed from say midnight to five a.m. and there's a little bit of snow in it, I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I try to find a fresher one. You know, it, it keeps me. If I if I take an older track. I'm always in my I'm in my head and I'm like, is this, is it, is this like is it, yeah. a day old? Am I ever going to see this deer? Is this deer three mountains over? Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's there's some stories like I took a buck. Uh, what was it two years ago? It was 2019. I took a buck track. I, I hunted this whole basin. Went up high, nothing. Went down low, nothing. Went back up high, and I cut a track. It was a buck track. I could see the the dimples in the snow. It was partially filled in. It was kind of old, but it snowed like the day before. Um, and it was all I had. And there was, I, I saw like a couple sets of doe tracks down low and I've already done like six miles at this point. So I'm like, I got to do something like if it's old and I don't go anywhere or whatever, we'll chalk it up as a bad day. We'll get them tomorrow, whatever. So I get on this track and I'm like, man, this thing's probably like a day and a half old, two days right. old, maybe. And I'm like, man, I'm probably not going to see this deer. But I said, it's all I got. So I hop on that track and I'm on the left side of the basin and this thing's cutting cross country down across the brook. 
down across the river really and then up towards the right side so i'm i'm on him probably three miles and it's still not really getting much fresh so i get up to about 2800 feet there's a big shelf up there kind of a lot of beaches up that way just before it turns into the green growth you know how there's like that clear divide up in, in those vermont mountains where like you're going from like beach and it's like holy shit you're in green growth yep so i'm just below that it's a good spot to be 100 percent, <laughs> and this kind of feeds into that i go up into that that range right there in that buck bedded down and the tracks coming out of that bed was like from that morning. So, I mean, he fed around, he got up to that shelf and like fed around. You can see it was a ton of tracks back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, tearing stuff up all a big beach night year. And, uh, I see that bed. There's a few beds, but I see the freshest bed right down to the, right down to the leaves. And there's like eight, eight, nine inches of snow up that high. And the tracks coming out of that are like from this morning. So I'm like, I'm in it now. This goes from like a day and a half old track that he's been up on this this shelf for a good day and a half, two days, milling around, and I got a fresh track now. So I go on him, and he starts going up high. He gets up into the green growth, thick stuff. Follow him for probably another two miles up there, and then I made a rookie mistake uh, then. So I, I was on that track. It was a nice track. It wasn't a four-finger, but, you know, a good three and a half, like like a nice track when you want to follow him, Vermont. Um, right. Get up in that green growth, and I see a track coming back down, right down the tracks. I'm like, is this him? It's like, it's relatively close in size and it's steep up there. And like, he's going right down and dropping off this edge. And it's like almost like vertical down into this river. And he's heading back across where we just came from. So I'm like, is this the same box? It's hard to sell it's with like eight, nine inches of snow and like looser stuff. It's hard to tell exactly how, how big and, and, and comparing it and stuff. So I didn't give it enough time looking at those two tracks next to each other. One coming this way and one going up. And I end up hopping on that track coming down. It looked a little bit fresher than the one going up. Still yep. that morning. Hop on him, take him down the valley, and we're probably half a mile before I realize that it's not the same deer. It just happens mm. to be a buck coming down. And it's getting later in the day at this point. Like, I had already gone all morning looking for a track, followed him up, <laughs> busted it all the way up the other side, and it's probably like 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm like, Ugh, son of a gun. So I'm not going to go back up that vertical stuff that I just came down following this track. So I'm like, well, I'll just follow this thing. Maybe it'll take me to a fresher one by chance if I'm lucky. Follow that one, go maybe another half a mile. And I see a bunch of feeding, bunch of feeding. I go like another 100 yards. He's slowing down, and I catch him in his bed, and it's uh, this ratty little fork horn. And I'm like, son of a gun. I just watched him for like 25 minutes, and then I was like, I'm not going to shoot that one. But uh it, it, it show, goes to show, like, even if you if I would have stayed on that track, I'm sure I would have caught that bigger one up high, but I just kind of got stupid. So that you you pass bucks in Vermont? Oh, yeah. In the uh, mountains? Yeah, 100%. Uh, you. A lot friend. of guys a yeah. lot of guys are going to say, nah, you don't do that. You shoot the first legal one you see. But I, I mean, do, too. Though. I pass them up. You got to, because yep. that's, like, maybe that buck that I passed up in, what was that, 2019? That little four-pointer? Yep. That might have been the eight that I got this year, you know? Absolutely. You, you got to. Absolutely. In those state forest bucks in Vermont, I mean. There's not. It's not like it's farm field hunting where there's a lot more deer living in thickets and they go out in the field at night. Like, right. if you sh- you're shooting the small bucks up in those, you're not going to see a big buck for a you're few right. years. I mean, unless one moves in, but like for the most part, you're not going to see. Absolutely. You kind of got to manage it in your own in your own way up there. in your own little hunting grounds. Yep. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with shooting little deer though. No, I'm and, not. I'm not taking away from that. Like, no, absolutely not. If you want to shoot a spike horn, and it makes you happy. Absolutely, you should do it. Hundred percent, yeah. If you're Absolutely, gonna enjoy it and you should get do the it. Rush out of it and, and get meat and all that stuff. I think more power. To passing you. on deer is totally. It's up to, up the, hunter. to the hunter, 100%. and you know, and I think everybody from Vermont should go down and hunt the Catskill Mountains because the Catskill Mountains have a three point antler restriction. Oh, okay. Just in the Catskills, like you've got to have three on a side. three on a side, like, just like, like Pennsylvania, just right? like Pennsylvania. Yeah. But the Catskills are a mountain range about the size of Rutland County, Vermont, mm-hmm. big, steep mountains, uh, lots of ledgy, crappy, whatever. It kind of a lot like Vermont, mm-hmm. but man, the bucks down there, some big ones, I mean, oh, they get a chance not to just big ones. So many bucks. Oh, it's just a fun. Lot of deer. It's fun to hunt because you're always engaged. You're walking up a ridge and there's, you know, 30, 40 scrapes, 100 rubs. Yeah. You know, because they're, every four corn, spike corn, and three pointer lives. And they're all intermingled. And they're all intermingled. And you're seeing bucks all the time. It's a lot of fun. Bucks are fighting, bucks are more vocal. It, everything about the hunt is more fun because those younger deer get a pass. Doing what deer should do. They're doing yeah. what deer should they're do. Not just constantly running away. And yeah. uh, I think everybody from Vermont 
that's serious about it should go down there and hunt. Mm -hmm. Because if you go down there and hunt, you would absolutely be for really? passing small bucks in Vermont. Just to see the potential of Oh, of man. If is. we had a three-point AR, we'd have good hunting, man. Oh, we'd, 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 have, we'd have guys coming no from other states to hunt but, here. Yeah. it's, it's uh, just Pennsylvania coming. is a prime example of it. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania used to have some of the tiniest little crappy little racks that you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. Um, but they did a three point out restriction and now they're shooting absolute mags every year. For sure. Yeah. There's some so there. that's an interesting point, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But like you said, it's up, up to if you, uh, if yeah, you, wanna... if you want to shoot spike corn, shoot spike corn. Shoot spike corn. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure. I, I mean, mean I, just, I just like to, I mean, I yeah, like hunting the bigger deer and you, I Me like too. to see them grow up a little bit. I mean, Absolutely. I like there's the something challenge to be said. It. Yeah. There's something to be said about chasing an older buck down and, and mm -hmm. getting him. Um, but yeah, to each their own with that, I guess. Yeah, to each is their own. If you want to shoot a small buck, shoot a small buck. I, I think, if you're, I think you should kill, you know, a bunch of bucks before you start passing them. Exactly. I, I yeah. don't. Th I don't think you should start passing mm -hmm. them right off. I think you should, you know, get ten under your belt 100%, or yeah, like, before you start passing them up because I think every kill, and, and you'll hear a lot of guys say this, is very valuable as a deer hunter. Mm -hmm. Every time you pull a trigger mm -hmm. is valuable, um, and it's you know things like that. But, for sure. Yeah, no, there's a lot to learn. I mean, sometimes following a younger deer will teach you a lot. If you want to get into tracking Absolutely. and you follow a younger buck track, 100%, you can learn a lot. Like one mm. of the, like I shot uh, a little six pointer. I don't know. I think it was 2017. It was late in the season tracking. Wasn't much snow in the early season. And I got on a, got on a track. I knew it wasn't a big one. It was ended up being a six pointer, like two and a half year old deer. But that buck that I followed honestly taught me more about tracking than most other bucks that I've tracked and killed yep no kidding that buck did it all he i cut him down low chased does around followed him up he fed he bed he laid scrapes down he rubbed and then i finally get to a spot and i can see where he like chased does around and like it looks like I, I i think it's where he like bred a doe it was all tore up right there and like yep. he was on him went like 100 yards from that spot the doe split off he went the other way jumped him he was laying underneath this like there's like this one little spruce tree on this hardwood ridge and he's laying underneath it you know how they do that sometimes yep and uh ended up ended up getting that deer like a mile later but that deer taught me so much absolutely and, i mean it, sometimes it, it pays to follow those younger deer but like nowadays I, I try to follow the bigger ones but right there's something to be said about learning from those smaller deer if you're just getting into tracking like don't just get in your mind like i'm only gonna go track a four finger buck because you might, absolutely you might yeah. go a whole season not right. see a four finger track or Right. Those those older deer, they get wiser. They know how to evade humans. They've been tracked. So yep. you might be more frustrated than and than anything and maybe say, hey, I don't want to track anymore. It's too hard or something like that. But, yeah, teach your own on that. Yeah, when I first started out tracking, when I was probably, you know, 16 is when I really started tracking because I got my driver's license. Mm -hmm. But I would just follow tracks. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was a buck, though, spike horn, 10-pointer. I didn't know. Yeah. I was just following deer tracks and, and I think that's a big part of it is just, you got to get into the rhythm of, you know, it's following tracks. So true. Like, yeah. Just follow some tracks, man. You, you don't have to go out there and kill a world record. It's how time, much you yeah. learn. Like just crazy how much you learn with following deer, like seeing how they navigate through a, a notch or through a thicket or yep, where absolutely. they'll take you. Like they'll take you to spots that you never knew existed, like highways and, and like, it's just crazy. For sure. No doubt about it. Something to say about that. I'm going to go back to that question I asked you um, about the age of tracks mm -hmm. um, and like what, you know, how old of a buck track you'll take. Yeah. To me, it's all situational on where I am and what time of year it is. 100%. Because if it if it's late season and there's been snow on the ground for five days, I'll take an old track any day of the week. 100%. Because they're yeah. not going very far. They're going to the feed. They're if eating. it's November 9th and I'm in the <laughs> and if I'm in the whites and I cut a big old track yeah. and it looks like it's a couple of days old, that thing's history, man. Oh yeah, he's, he's in the next county over. No, that's a good point. And um, another thing is area wherever I'm at because mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, if I find a four finger in Vermont. I got a hard time walking over that thing. I don't care how old it is. It's a good point. Yeah, they're rare. You, it, it they are you. so it hard to find. I just want to. I just want to know something about that deer. Mm -hmm. I don't care if Maybe I don't you get show him. you a little buck nest that he's. Oh he's man, out something. Of, you know, and I've, and you I've can... gotten into bucks in Vermont, taking mm -hmm. old tracks. But I think if you're in places like New Hampshire or Maine, yeah, you got to find your fresh one, especially during the rut. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, so, you no, know, that's and, a good point. And trying to get, you know. 
I've, I've spent so many days on tracks that I thought were fresh mm-hmm. death creeping yep. on a, a track that was probably two days old just because it was a perfect snow. Yep. 32 degrees. Hard to age it, yeah. hard to age it man. Yeah. But you know what? I learned a lot about tracking on those days and that you have to go into the woods every single day with the attitude of, I'm going to learn something about deer. Mm-hmm. You got to be a deer nerd. Mm-hmm. If I, you, if you're not trying to learn, you got to learn something every, like you said, every day. Like, every day. That's what makes, I think, the best trackers that there are out there. Mm-hmm. People that understand the deer activity. Like, you got to go out and experience it, is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. To really get a full understanding of it. Yeah, you got to do it a lot and you got to fail a lot. Oh, absolutely. Man, I've messed up more tracks than I can even count. Mm-hmm. The bucks that I've screwed up on, so, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I, you know, but that's what you, that's what it takes. 100%. You can't be the kind of person that fails at something and then gives it up. Because, oh, I might be able to go hunt, you know, my uncle's farm and see a bunch of does every day and maybe shoot a four pointer. No, it's you, you got to go commit. out to the big woods. You got to go and you got to sweat your butt off mm-hmm. looking for that big track and, and you got to get into it or you're not going to get good. It, at yeah, it. you got to commit. It's a mindset yeah, thing that you're going to do it. It's totally and a mindset. If thing. you're always leaning on that plan B, like, oh, like you said, I'm going to go shoot one somewhere else, then you're not going to. You're never going to do it. No, no. you got to fall in love with it. Mm-hmm. You really it's do. True. Yeah. That's what that's a, that's a big barrier for some people. Like a lot of people love the idea of it. Absolutely. Like tracking is romanticized now with all the with all the podcasts and, and the YouTube videos and the posts, yep. this, that, and third. But some people, you get out there and they're like, boy, funny. this kind of sucks yeah. if I go all day and never cut a buck track. I'm like, eh, I don't think I'm going to do this. I think I'm going to go sit on a stump somewhere and, on yeah. the edge of a field. And But, I mean, teach your own if you want to do that for sure. But yeah, like do Isaac it. said, you got to fall in love with it. Yep. We kind of want to go over some stuff um, about Maine. Everybody knows kind of buck tracking has been, been – bred in maine essentially and i kind of i i was doing some research on isaac here i was looking back at some pictures and looking at a few things and and he said he shot at the biggest buck of his life up in maine was that 2019 yeah 2019 what was the story i, I i'm a sucker for deer stories so like i want to hear that what was the story of that because like i've shot at giants in maine like and yeah i don't know i just love the deer stories that come out of maine because it's a different style of hunting up there it's a lot of fun but yep. what's the story on that one so it was the first time i'd been to maine tracking i went when i was a little guy with my dad probably 2008 or 9 mm-hmm. i went up with my dad up to northern maine and we just kind of you know we we hunted a little bit but it wasn't nothing serious i was just a little guy but 2019 first time i ever been up to northern maine stayed in a camp that my buddy owns and uh it was probably i'm trying to think back everything blends together man but uh i think it was the day after thanksgiving Riding the roads, looking for a big track. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what we did pretty much every morning, me and my buddy Nate. And we ended up finally cutting a absolute Gohebohorbus. <laughs> that means big buck for anybody that doesn't know. Uh, of a buck track. Like one of the biggest ones I think I've ever seen. And it was old. Mm-hmm. But we were struggling to find a real big one. You know, we were finding the, you know, probably 170, 180s. Yeah, but not one that. Night. We not weren't that finding the big, big one that not the Gohebo Horbus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we found the big one. Yeah. And it was old, and it's funny how we just talked about this, but I took that old track. Me and my buddy, we double teamed it. We got on it and uh, tried to keep our spirits up because it was old. Mm-hmm. Maybe a day or two old. This was the day after Thanksgiving, you said? Yes. Okay. So it, it was an old track, probably 10 inches of snow. Okay. Some, yeah. Good good snow though yep. 40 degrees melting yep. quiet as sin mm-hmm. and uh we're going on it and i one thing that i'll i'll remember for the rest of my life is only like 100 yards into the track job i found a big old wad of i think it was like alder bark that must have fallen out of his rack no no alder nothing no around. alders around just fall it, right it off just fell off his rack no when he rubbed, that yeah. must get you excited yeah i put it in my pocket okay yep, yep so that was cool and um kept going on him and he took us to timbuktu and back one side of the state to the other pretty much you know <laughs> he was doing one of those on a mission. uh he took us through every swamp within about two miles he really? walked right through the middle of them and uh he ended up getting down in this little area where there was a bunch of moose mm. kicked up a bunch of moose yep. and uh about four or five big old signposts and then hit, we, hit every single signpost. he hit every single one yeah and that's when i stopped tracking and started hunting yeah and that's one thing that 
I definitely really try to do is when I get into an area that I think's like really hot and I, and we were also cutting, we kept cutting them off. Like yeah. that old track turned into a, a pretty oh, fresh okay. track. So he was, he was doing stuff in there with those yep, and stuff. Yep, yep, yep. It, it turned into a barnyard situation. And, and when that happens, I just forget about the deer track mm-hmm. completely. I don't care what the tracks are doing. My head is up on a swivel. Mm-hmm. Safety is ready to come off and I'm ready to kill a big buck. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you know, I start creeping. I'm not tracking anymore. Once I hit all those signposts in the barnyard, whatnot. And the tracks fresh. Oh, fresh, fresh, smoke right fresh yeah, yeah. at this point. Yeah. And so I got my head up on a swivel. I'm looking around and I catch a piece of antler coming through the, uh, it was like a, a bunch of spruces down in this area, probably like a 10 year old cut. Mm-hmm. And he's coming through and I had my, uh, 7,600 carbine with a scope on it. Wish I didn't have a scope, but I had the scoped one and he comes into a little opening and he's, he's kind of moving fast quarter and to me at probably about 80 yards. Mm -hmm. And I took a shot deer kept running or he kept going the same way he was headed. And it was weird because, like, I'd pull up my gun and I couldn't find him, but when I'd pull it down, I could see pieces of him. So that's where the whole peep sight thing kind of uh-huh. – it kind of got stuck up in my mind, like, all right, I need to go to a peep sight. Oh, you but, didn't have a peep gun at this time? No. Okay. I, I had one, but, but I wasn't very confident with it. Yeah, you so were scoped. I, I mean, a lot of people start – yeah. I have I had both, yeah. but they'd both – they'd come with me, but I'd leave one usually, mm-hmm. you know, at the house or at the camp, wherever I was at. Mm-hmm. But – so anyways – I never hit that deer. I hit a tree right in front of him. The deer had no idea we were there. So we get over, look at the tracks, no blood, nothing. Beautiful buck, Mm -hmm. you know, beautiful, beautiful rack, big, wide, thick, everything. He had it all. And we start following him and he comes into a big cattail swamp. I look to my left and he's looking at us like a hundred yards out in the swamp. I pull up and he's bounding off. We saw each other at the same time. I took another crack shot at him and I never connected. And that was at probably three. Really? So and that time he saw us. Yeah. The first time, it was kind of windy that day too. So the first time, I don't even think he even really knew mm-hmm. that somebody shot at him. Yeah. But so, yeah, that's pretty much the so he story. Went out, he went out in that swamp. You guys saw each other and he was peacing. And he was gone. And yeah. we followed him for. How far of a shot out in that swamp? Probably 100. 100. Yeah. 100 yards. Yeah. It's hard. It's I've shot a deer in, in that long stuff before. It's hard. Like. You can kind of visualize where you think that, but you might be way off. Like, ah, I think the body's there if you're shooting through whips and, and like, whips and crap. Yeah. yeah it's like, ah, and then you end up being your way off or you, you know, you've clean mess, but it's like, it's, it's a gamble, you know? And, and then a follow up on that story is the very next year, my buddy, Nate, who was double teaming with me that very day was in that same little piece mm. and shot a nice nine pointer with a similar rack. Not the same buck though. You don't, think? I think it might've been the was same the buck, same? but. The buck he shot had a very, like, it kind of had low tines, mm-hmm. good mass, and the buck, the backbone on that thing was just sticking out like nothing crazy, right. nothing left him. Right he now. was not in good shape. Yeah. And I think if it was the same buck, he went downhill a lot, like really? probably lost 20 inches or something mm-hmm. out of his rack. But if not, you know, probably just genetics are similar in that area. Mm-hmm. But the one that Nate killed in there, though, was definitely an old one. Well, that one way when he what did you say? One eighty two. One eighty two. And that was Thanksgiving still, week. Still a good buck. Good run buck. Out, run out. You said good buck. Yeah, wicked. Yeah, so but I think it was age and rut. Okay. I so it was kind of like combo. Late, yeah, late life type stuff. Yep. Yeah. And huh. um, but a good buck. Did you, have you seen that one? I don't think I've seen that. Yeah, one. I'll, I'll have to show you after. a picture after. Yeah. That's pretty but, cool. I those main the main horn genetics are or something. It's so cool. Like. I'll show you a picture out. I got this one buck on camera in Maine, northern Maine. It's this beast of a the biggest four pointer you've ever seen in your life. It, it literally he, we call him forklift because his his forks are so okay. big. Come right up, swoop yeah. out, giant four pointer, probably 200, 210 pound deer. That's crazy. Just living in a swamp, no horn genetics, it, but like it's a co- one of the coolest deer you've seen. I'll show you that right camp now. I go to up in Maine. My buddy Leo mm-hmm. has a picture of a deer. Just really? like that, it, people shoot two hundred pound spike horns. It's just it's, it, he calls them uh, pitchfork is what right. he calls them, and he, they've been after him for years. It'd be so cool to get one. I was like, you don't see. He's it. just a big forky, yeah. like a two hundred and twenty pound forky, exactly. Yeah, but big good. forks. You know, he's like oh, yeah. big, 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 big giant forks. Maybe it's the same buck. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> they're just so cool. It's just a, like kind of kind of ties back to what we were talking about before the genetic differences in the state. Like, oh, Maine, absolutely. You got these these 
brutes, and then you go to New Hampshire and you get these big racked mountain bucks, and then Vermont you get a little smaller, and then Massachusetts you get these gnarly old ones with character. It's just it's crazy. It all ties back into each other. But yep, yeah, genetics. I've always been fin- like, I've been super fascinated with whitetail genetics, and I think if you pay attention to the record keeping that's done in the different states, like uh, the Vermont Big Game Trophy Club. The New Hampshire Antler and Skull Club. You're right into that stuff, right? You you look into those numbers all the time. I look into those numbers, and I know the counties that are producing. Mm -hmm. And that will narrow down your search Mm. for a bit. A lot of guys are going to hate I'm saying this right now. I don't (laughs) know. Whatever. You know, because only the serious of the serious of the serious are actually going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but that's what the record keeping systems are for. Yeah. Yeah. To look at. You know what I mean? So, if if you're on a quest for a big deer, you got to hunt where the big deer live. You got to hunt where the big deer are. Exactly. That's a good you point. You hit it right on I the head. I think a yeah. lot of people are going <laughs> to gonna start looking at some horns. Yeah. Horn I mean, numbers on well, that. you know. That's a pretty good point. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Yeah. I'll have to show you a picture of that big four after. It's crazy. I'm a sucker for big fours and stuff They're like so that. They're so cool. So cool. Yeah. yeah. I don't know it's if you saw a couple of guys got big five pointers in Massachusetts this year. I think really? uh, Jeremy Ballantine and then Brandon Lane. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think both of them like on the yep. same day. Really? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah like hammers. I think Jeremy's was like a 24-inch wide. Oh, really? Oh, just monsters. not much for Yeah, I think it was like the first or second day of the shotgun season down there. No way. Huh. Yeah, they That's took the... pictures of them together. They're both just five-pointers. Yeah. But just mega giants. Did, did you make it up to Maine this year, or did you not go to Maine this year? I did. You did? Yep, okay, yeah, I did. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. about that. Yeah, I went up. Uh, I hunted Thanksgiving week, and I... Got a little bit of snow the first morning. It was gone by 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Then I got a little bit of snow on Friday. Because there wasn't much snow until that last week. No. Because no, the only only snow I tracked on was the last day of yep. the main season. Yep. So I got a little bit Monday, a little bit Friday, and then we got hammered Friday night into Saturday. Mm-hmm. We got, we like got what, eight, like, 10 inches that day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the whole week I was kind of bouncing around. I was driving like an hour and a half south to Jackman yep. and hunting the higher elevations where everybody else was too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the guys talk about that, how, you know, Jackman sometimes turns into a... I heard this year oh, particularly man. it was it was, it was crazy. very busy. In but it's just like anything, though. You get back a mile and there's no one, you know? Mm-hmm. Or you get 100 yards off the road and there's it's no true, one. It's true, yeah. I know a lot of people sitting, and sitting in cuts close to the road That's and, and it. this and that and beating yeah. around, but... They're out there for sure. It can get busy. It can get frustrating in those oh, spots. A lot of green plates up there, Mister. Oh yeah, don't oh, get them with yeah. the Mainers going on the green plates. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they hate us. Oh up there. man, yeah. I didn't get I to track it. a buck in Maine on snow until the last day, and I went. So I was in Vermont that week before, and then we saw we had snow coming that that last day, man. So I'm like, I'm gonna get in the truck and I'm gonna drive to Maine that last day. I got in the truck like 2 a.m. And it was a shit show driving from Vermont to Maine in that snowstorm. It took me like six hours to get to Wilson's Mills, which is just across the border from New Hampshire. And I got up in there, did a lot of loops, cut a lot of doe tracks, and finally got on a small buck track and ended up catching up to it in its bed. It was just a big spike horn. But oh, no last kidding. day, I was like, ah, I. I got a lot of I got a lot of grief for that one. People were like, "Oh, it's the last day you get a last day, shot it. man." But I said, "Ah, it was oh, the first man. time I ever been in Wilson Mills too." It just, oh no, kidding! Hunting in that area, it's like it's right across the border. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for had it. Had you killed any deer up to that point in the season? Yeah, I already had my Vermont. Oh down. yeah, yeah. I, had you Vermont, had, I had a nice. So Vermont you had buck. meat. I had meat. Yeah, I was just gonna. Right. Yeah. And your dad got one. He got a big it, six. It, right. And, yeah, there was deer around. Yeah, see, I'm a around. meat hunter first. Yeah. You know, I, you. I mean, like, yeah, you filled a couple of doe tags right this year. Or uh, you got I got one, doe, one. right? I got yeah. a doe and right around this area right here. Yeah. Right within probably a mile, there's about 25, 30 doe. Yeah. And maybe two or three bucks. So <laughs> a <little> bit. <laughs> it's kind of out of whack in this area of Vermont. But yeah, I mean, I'm a meat hunter first. Yeah. I have sense. no shame I, in that. You got to be. It, that's my dad, usually, my dad usually takes care of that as far yeah, as, yeah, as yeah. He, he's not afraid to shoot a smaller deer, which is nothing wrong with that. Um, he he gets one every single year, so it's, absolutely. But yeah, I already got a nice eight point in Vermont at that point, and I was going to Maine. I said I'm going to go one more day. I hear you. And try to get on a good track, and just never happened. But yep. got up to a small one. But. Oh, good, good for you for passing on them. Yeah, I mean, it's hunting. sometimes tough to do. It is, especially the last day. You're like eh, eh, sitting yeah, there, yeah. like sixty yards away, bedded, and I just just big hammer spikes sticking up. I'm like, yep. oh man, why don't you have a, at least like, a good fork on you? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But I had hunted Maine the first week. Uh, first few days of the first week, bare ground, warm. A buddy went up with me. He was filming me for the first couple of days. We saw like 10 deer. I think we saw one spike corn and like eight or nine doe. 
Uh, then we had to come back, and then second week I stayed in the back of my truck up there. Um, That's rugged. Yeah, That's cool, it's man. Cool. I want to do I, shit I kinda like that. It, 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 the worst part of staying in your truck for a week is uh, you get out of the deer woods at like 5 o'clock, and it's dark from 5 to like 9 when you go to bed. So I you're just sitting you. there like twiddling your thumbs. Twiddling your thumbs. What would you eat? Uh, so I brought a cooler. I brought a lot of deer meat. made a lot of like, a little Coleman stove. Were you breath. alone, you said? Yeah, just for the week. Dude, that's wild. It was wild, yeah. <laughs> you get bored by, like, Thursday. You go and you sit in the gas station parking lot for an hour <laughs> just to be around people. <laughs> it's different, for sure. Yeah. kind of got cold that week, but ended up shooting at a giant that week. Um, yeah, tell me that story. So, yeah, it was bare ground the whole first week. Uh, second week, the same. I think it was Wednesday of the second week. Um, and that first week, I kind of – we did we did more scouting than anything um, that first week with my buddy. And we found a few areas that had some, some really nice, uh, a lot of, a lot of scrapes, a lot of rubs, um, good group of does kicking around, a lot of sign. Um, kind of, it wasn't even up super up high. It was kind of closer to town, but it was like out behind some like ten year old cuts. Yep. Um, so the cuts were kind of getting a lot real whippy and stuff. Like not a lot of like browsing and stuff going to cuts. Right. But we found this old. So like the cuts kind of stopped, and then there was this like one road. Like they were gonna, they were gonna cut out and do some more cuts farther out. But they just built this road, never ended up cutting farther out. So on this road, there was a scrape. And this road's like probably three miles long. When I say road, it's like a blowdowns all over it, but like an old skid trail pretty much. Every 50 yards down this road for like two or three miles, there's a scrape and a rub. Everything's tore up. And like they were using – the do- there was does in the area, and those bucks were just like cruising this this road for like two or three miles. And just to, like – I think they were just checking everything, laying scrapes down everywhere. So that Wednesday – I'd hunted the day before, saw a few doe. I think I saw a spike horn, um, could have shot then. Um, but I knew there was a big one in there. That's kind of the area where that, that big four was, which we ended up seeing that thing. I think, I think we ended up seeing that one. So that Wednesday, we're creeping out through that road and uh, kind of, or probably about two miles in. And there's like a rise in the trail there. And I'm probably like 100 yards back from that rise. And I hear what sounds, you know, like you see on YouTube, like a moose raking a tree. It sounds like someone's yep. taking like a, a paddle to yeah, like yeah. a tree whacking it. I'm like, oh, yeah. there must be like a bulls raking a tree or something up there. So I'm like, that's pretty cool. So I start hustling up there. I'm like, oh, I'm going to see a moose. going to see a moose. I get up there. I look over this little rise down into like kind of like a little swampy bowl, just this one little low spot in the trail. And there's two bucks fighting. And as soon as I get up on this rise and look down, they're breaking off. Like they didn't see me. They were just like, the fight was done. Uh, big one starts chasing the smaller one, which the smaller one I think was that big four pointer because I could just see big forks going. He was the, the smaller one. Yeah, listen to, this, <laughs> listen to this. I think it was that big four pointer we're talking about, but I could be wrong. I mean, there's a bunch of deer in that area. I could just see big forks kind of, and they were like bounding through the woods. Big one was chasing it, so that smaller one goes to the left, and this is probably like 80 yards in front of me. It's thick though, so thick, and uh, the bigger one turns back and goes back to where they were. So that smaller one kind of goes to my left and I'm like, I saw it had big forks. So I'm like, I'm going to shoot it. If <laughs> I'm going to shoot it. If it comes like, it looked like a big heavy deer. So that thing goes to the left stops. And I, I can just see like the ass end of it. Um, and then the other one's kind of up on the little down in that little swamp hole where you can't see it's thick. And all of a sudden that smaller one that just got chased off comes bolting back by me, like 30 yards bounding thicker than hell in there. I pull up, I'm like trying to get a hole through, trying to get a hole through and like, I have a scope gun for when it's like bare ground. I got like a Model 4 Remington 30 out 6 automatic, kind of heavy, but it's a good gun. Trying to find, so 3 9 scope on it. Trying to find it like 30 yards going through this thick stuff. Couldn't get it, couldn't go in. It was like bounding, bounding, bounding. But the whole time that thing's cut across, the other buck that's bigger that I just saw that went in, back into where I couldn't see is grunting. Bleh, bleh, bleh. So Every that step. smaller one goes away. So I'm like, all right, I'm still in it. Like, I wish I could have got a crack at that one, but. So that one goes away. I can hear it take off through the thick stuff. And I say thick, thick. Um, so I'm sitting there for like 30 minutes. I'm grunting, trying to get this bigger one to come back. That buck, every time I would grunt, 10 seconds later, bleh, right back at me. So I'm like, this is so cool. Like, how often is this? We're, we're like communicating for like 30 minutes. Wow. Not moving. He's in this one spot in this little thicket. I cannot see. Grunting, 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 grunting. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah. And then, I don't know, like I said, 30 minutes goes by. And the trail that I was on... It was to my left. I kind of hopped off it to kind of see down in that hole a bit better. And all of a sudden, a deer jumps out into the trail. So I'm like, up. I'm like, oh, and just a big doe. I'm like, oh, okay, what the heck? Almost <laughs> yeah, got testy there for a second. She takes off, and then probably like 10 seconds later, the biggest rack buck I've ever seen. Oh, White, is, you're in a thicket, so you're thinking like darker orange, you think, yep. like spruce stuff. The biggest, tallest 
white rack buck I've seen up there, like giant bucks, jumps out in the trail, and he's going away from me right on that doe's ass. Right. And I pull up, and I get like, you can see like kind of where the shoulders, because I got like a little bit of a downhill shoot, so I can see like the shoulder, back of the shoulder blade. So I'm like, I'm going to put it like dead center on the back, try to drive one in there. Right. Shoot. Deer goes down. I'm like, oh, I just hit him. And then what he was actually doing, he's diving underneath a blowdown just as I shot. So I'm like, as he was going down, I shot. And I think I shot over him. But I was like, oh, I thought I hit him, but he was just going to the blowdown. And then I had one more, like, crack as he was going down that trail. And that one hurt. No <laughs> that one was a big one. That was away, a really yeah. big one. Oh, Ooh. biggest main buck I've seen. But it was fun. I mean, how often do you get to walk up on two bucks fighting and, like, grunting, vocalizing like that? You don't see that a lot back Not this often. way. Um, but it was no. a blast. No yeah, kidding. stayed in the truck that week. Slugged it out. Saw That's cool. Saw three bucks that week. Saw a little four-pointer, too. And the spike, and then I guess about four bucks. Spike, little four pointer, and then the bigger, whatever the, the smaller one of the fight that was still a good deer, right? And then that big one. But well, geez, you were in a pretty good pocket of deer then. there. Yeah, it was just like this That's one spot bad. closer to town. Like it wasn't up in the mountains, but like it's right. where I found the biggest concentration of sign. No and kidding. On bear well, that's, ground, you gotta that's you gotta, where you do gotta, what gotta you be. Gotta do. And I was just hunting that that's one area for a whole week. And bear ground hunting is an art. It's tough. It's tough, especially up it there. It's an art. It's. How do you kind of go, like, if you're hunting bear ground? I cover a lot of ground, man. Yeah. I cover a lot of ground, and I'm looking for buck sign. Yeah. Lots you, you and lots of buck sign. You see a lot of sign. Yeah. Something that's yep. like, there's a deer in here. That's kind of what yep. that was. Like, yep. we pounded some ground the week before, but, like, this area had, like, everything was right here. More sign than seen anywhere. You know, it's funny. When you're hunting in the big woods on, on bear ground, you have to be very optimistic. Mm-hmm. Because it's real easy to fall into the oh yeah you know, it's bear ground not moving not moving they're not man. I'm not good you know mm-hmm. but you really do have to have a good attitude because you know what you're out there you're getting good exercise mm-hmm. you're finding new buck sign you're you're in new areas whatever mm-hmm. but you will stumble on bucks oh yeah it every once like in that. a while it happens yeah. like that yeah. Yeah. at least expect it like yep. I wasn't expecting to walk up on two deer fight I'd hunted through there the whole day before and saw one couple deer but like. You, yeah, you got to stay optimistic. Yeah, and you got to go. That stuff That's will wear big, you down yeah. too. That bear ground hunt will wear you down. It but you got to go. You got to. Yep. If you're, every day is different in the woods. Yep. But. Yep. It's always an opportunity to learn something and you know find a big deer. I found a lot of big deer on bear ground days just mm-hmm. because I was in areas that I wouldn't have been on if I had a fresh snow. Yeah, just because you're looking. Because I was looking. Nothing else. Yep. Yeah. I was just like, oh, what do I have to lose? Mm-hmm. It's bear ground. I'm gonna mm-hmm. go poke around on this knob that I've never been on before. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not on those good killing snow days i'm on a ridge that i know there's a buck you know so yeah there's something to be said about it yeah it takes a lot it'll wear you down but you just got to stick with it because it it does get tough what uh what do you run for cameras like not the brands or anything i'm just number wise yeah like are you you a big camera guy uh yeah i run about mm, probably 10 12 15 cameras a year Um, most of them in vermont put a couple up in maine when i go up there Yep. A um, few cell cameras, which some people don't like, some people do. I don't know. I, I got some. I think it's cool. I, yeah. It's, it's cool. I mean, you don't particularly hunt over them or anything, but it's cool to see, like, absolutely what's going on when you get the photo dump once a day or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, because, I mean, like, I have some. I'm a young guy. I'm working full time. Yeah, you got you to gotta give yourself I, every advantage I, you can give yourself. I, I don't have time to drive over to New Hampshire mm-hmm. to check a camera. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not – I'll never use a camera to kill a buck. Mm-hmm. But – Research. It's – more or less, I'm putting cameras out to see what's in the area. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of the cameras that I put out are just regular game cameras. I just want to see what the ge- like the genetics are like in that area. Yeah. I want to see if it's an area that will produce a 130 100%. or a 160. Yeah. You yeah. know, because that is a – it's a Something thing. you get excited about. You see yeah. a big buck, you're like, Absolutely. all right, he's in here. You get a fresh yep. snow, you're fired up, you're charged up to really get in there and get yep. after it. But, but no, in I the, agree. In the big woods – I don't think there's a lot of cases where you could use a camera to kill a buck. You <laughs> yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, like it, how agree. some people are like, oh, it's, it's not, you know, uh, it's not fair chase and this, that, and the other thing. Okay. Maybe not in the suburbs. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not in it's Ohio. Not like, yeah. It's not like the deer pattern in the no. deer. Like that you might get in, a picture of a yeah. buck and you might not see that buck ever right. again. Right. Versus it, like if you're hunting it, fields and, and lower stuff. And in the suburbs, I still don't care Mm -hmm. i think you should be able to use cell cameras because to each is their own yeah it's it's, legal it's and you can use them mm -hmm. so give yourself an advantage give yourself an advantage you know that's the way we're all headed with technology anyways everything's advancing take advantage of it but you know i'm just saying in the big woods 
like I said before, I've never used one to kill deer. You can't. No. If no. you you know what's funny about game cameras in the big woods? Uh, if you get a picture of a big buck in the big woods, a lot of the times it's too late. Yeah. It's too late. He's already Good gone point. through. Mm-hmm. He might come through again in a week. He might come through again in three days, but there's no way to tell. Yeah. They're you just know, doing whatever they want to do. And there. that's kind of like a theory that I have that I've been trying to practice a little bit more as I get older is when I find these areas that I'm like, oh man, like this is like a spot I need to put a camera. Mm-hmm. I'm just not putting cameras there and I'm just hunting it on the day where I put the most, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. On when a buck will come cruising through yep. because usually I'm not super far off. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, this is a Halloween November 4th spot, you yeah. know, something like that. Yeah, and, yeah. and a lot of the times, Halloween to November 4th, a big buck, mm-hmm. daylights in that spot. And, and a lot of that comes down to the know-how that you get from being out in the woods and understanding how these deer move yep. around the hills, move around the mountains, yep. use funnels and valleys and all that stuff. It, and it, running a bunch of cameras. It all comes off of your years. efforts. It's not like you're yep. just you're putting a camera there and getting lucky. Hey, there's a buck here. It's, it all comes down to learning what those deer showed you over the years. Absolutely. And I run probably... Oh, it's like somewhere between 20 and 30 cameras every year. Oh, wow. Yeah, and... Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. all public land. Um, I don't have any private permission, anything like that. It's Mm -hmm. all public land. Yep. And a lot of the cameras that I'm putting out are on community scrapes. Yep. That's pretty, that's all I do Mm -hmm. because I want to know buck inventory Mm -hmm. in my areas. And that's pretty much it. That's, that's what I use the cameras for is buck yeah, inventory. Just see what's there. Uh, I'm not using it for on feeding sign or crossings or mm-hmm. anything like that. Just because, you know, I, I just want to know what, what's in the area yeah, and I'll know. go in there and hunt it based off the sign. Yep. Uh, but if you can find a, a big community scrape, man, you can get every buck on that hill on that camera. Mm-hmm. And you know you what's know? in there and know what to get excited about and what yep. your chance to, you know, it's, are you big on mock scrapes? Have you done any of those? I do. I do set up some mocks. Like if I'm, uh, Sometimes, yeah, I'll pop a mop, mock scrape up on the mountain somewhere. Yep. Um, but like you said, I try to find more of the, the natural stuff. Ones, yeah. I mean, you can you can be up in the woods and rip a mop, mock scrape up, and uh, right. you might not ever get a picture on that thing. Mm-hmm. It, it, you gotta you gotta learn where the deer, you, how the deer are using those mountains, and, and where. Like when I'm setting cameras in the mountains, I like I like focusing on like the saddles. I love right. the saddles up. So like you get up three thousand feet. Yep. You got a green growth knob. You got a green growth knob on on each side. Yep. And you got this little hardwood funnel that's maybe mm-hmm. maybe it's only a hundred feet lower in elevation yep. from those knobs. But if that whole mountain range green, 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 and then just one little saddle, even if it's a hundred right. feet, little different timber, you, there's gonna be deer going through. So that. you like those big geological features? Yeah, I think I yeah, mean those are cool. Yeah. You can usually get a lot of I mean, you might only get a picture of a buck once up there, but at least you know there's deer going through there. You know that big one fifty? Yeah, the eight, one you're showing eight me. pointer I showed you yep. from Vermont a few years ago. That was a geological feature like really? that. Yeah. It was a pinch. <clears throat> it's like a skinny ridge, mm-hmm. and it's like a lot of them just run the top of it because it's like steep on both sides. Yes, it's the only place they got, and it comes up into a big saddle where they can go left or right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that kind of ties back to like, like you said, I like using the geological features on if it's a new area. Yep. Say like I haven't been in there much, but yep. like I'm going to put myself in a position where I'm going to like the highest percentage is to get a picture. Like if I've never been in there, like this is my first time in there, I'll pop a camera there. And maybe if I leave it there for a month, I might not get much for pictures. But the more time you're going to spend in those areas, you're going to find where the community scrapes are, right. the signpost rubs, the rub right. lines, the scrape lines, and stuff like that. So it all comes – you can kind of narrow it down from there. But mm-hmm. in a new area, that's what I like to focus on is the, the saddles and the pinch points and funnels and stuff like that because they're up there. You just got to find them. Now, when do you like to set your cameras and when do you like to check them slash pull them? Mm-hmm. Or is that at the same time? Do you check them when you pull them? Uh, so uh, typically what I do, I'll – I kind of go late. Um, sometimes, some years I go earlier, but usually if I have all my cameras out by end of August, that's that's, that's what I do. That's a yeah. good because at that end of August, the the horns they they start to drop their velvet. Stuff mm-hmm. starts to change. You get the colder nights. Stuff yeah, starts changing patterns. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole pattern, whole pattern change. But usually by end of August, if I get them out by then, that gives me enough time to kind of understand what's going on. You see the the patterns from velvet to pre rut to you know up right up to rut because i'll usually check them so like if i put a camera out in august i'll usually check that one on the mountain a few weeks before the season maybe like two weeks before rifle kicks off or something like that and then right. that usually gives you enough data to go off of see what's in there and absolutely stuff. because once the season comes those but they start chasing those you might not ever get another it's irrelevant know. exactly it's irrelevant. but it's like like you said it gives you an inventory of what's in there understanding 
the types of deer that are in there and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's a good point. But yeah, yeah, then I usually pull them into the season. I mean, I'll leave them up there you in do, a rut yeah. and like, it's sporadic. Yep. And like, sometimes you get a few new bucks that show up during the season you've never seen, right. um, even up on the, up on the mountains. But, uh, so one strategy I use, and I do this quite often is in the winter time, I will be e-scouting a mm-hmm. bunch of different areas that I've never touched. Yep. And I'll go in in August and I'll set cameras and I'll just leave them. Okay. Until next spring. And the oh, following okay. spring. Really? So I won't touch them once. Really? And then when I grab them the next spring, that'll be my determining factor of it if I'm going to hunt it or not. Yeah, that's a it, that's a good plan. That's a full season full and, season data and, right there. And that's I do that all the time that makes sense. and it's it's kind of fun, you know, because mm-hmm. you're putting out these little you know, little nest eggs, little man. nest eggs, man. <laughs> yeah. You're investing yeah. is what you're doing. You're 100%. investing in your future seasons yeah. because while you're hunting in these areas, you got cameras scouting for you, mm-hmm. you know? So that, that's, that's one thing that I've done a lot of since I was younger. And I think it's really panned out for me. Yeah. I think, I think some other guys have talked about that, but yeah. I don't, you don't hear a ton about, no, that. you don't hear a lot no, about you don't hear that. A ton you're just working, that. working smarter. You know, you're getting yep. all that data. And I mean, I'm like, doing that with $25 cameras. You got the all the all Walmart special. Pasco. Yeah, baby. That's what I Yep. Yep. Twenty five dollars. Yep. Best camera I ever owned. Exactly. My buddy and I were just talking about Dude, that the other day. Unreal. He's got a big real. They're for, great. It's not like the twenty five dollar cameras of five years ago. Pasco sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> cheap little yeah. green little freaking things and they work good. That's you can yeah. buy a pile of them and not feel bad if they if one who dies cares? on you. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Versus buying a two hundred. Want to use one as a one. hammer? Who cares? <laughs> it's twenty five bucks. Yeah. Like, no, I feel you. You buy four of them for the typical cost of like a camera five years ago. Mm-hmm. Like it's, and they're actually dependable. Mm-hmm. They work. I, I haven't had one fail yet. The only time I've had them fail, which if you don't know this, if you have like you know like the the spy point cell adapters, you can plug them into an existing. camera. My dad has a pile of them. Don't plug those into the Tasco. Okay. Go right, fry good. the Tasco. Kill them. All right. Really? So, yeah. So if those of you, if you're using the little cheap Walmart green Tascos and you want to buy the little cell point adapter that you can plug into an exist camera, don't plug those into the Tascos. Yep. I fried three of them this year doing that. <laughs> Learned the hard way. I mean, but whatever. They're $25 yeah, cameras. So that's not a big deal. Yeah. But just so you know, that's it. Yeah. But cool. I like those little cell points. Those things are handy. You ever use any of that? You said your dad has some. He has a bunch of those cell links. Yeah, you just yeah. strap them to the tree. I don't have them. any of those. I have the cell micro LTEs. Okay. My spy point. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten into the, like, the Tacticam reveals yet. Yeah. Those are pretty Seems good. Seems like those are kind of like the higher end cell yeah. cameras maybe. I don't, but this, the thing about the spy points is if I have one that doesn't work, I put it back in the box. I bring it to Dick's Sporting Goods up in Rutland, the local city yeah. to me, <laughs> and they give me a new one. Yeah. And then I go bring that one out and... Whatever, yeah, you know, but I haven't had many issues. Yeah, I've had my best luck's been with those little little cell adapters. Yeah, for me, I mean, yeah. I I had uh, so last year I had a the only like cell cam cell cam I had not the adapter. I had a muddy uh, I can't even, I don't know what they're called muddy something. It was like a sixteen megapixel right brown one. Worked great all season last year. So I'm like, all right, I'll buy a few more this year. I bought two brand new ones this year and neither both duds out of the box tried to get them returned couldn't get it couldn't get it anything back for money it was like i'm like ah, i'm not gonna use money anymore but not trying to not trying to bash on them but they're just two bad ones yeah no i hear you yeah it, that's and that word gets around too i mean a lot of people have bad things to say about spy point but like i've had no yeah, issues it all comes with them, that, yeah, if yeah. I, one of my buddies bought case. a one of my buddies bought a mole tree cell camera mm-hmm. and that thing was garbage really Everything in. about it was garbage. I hated that thing. It never worked. And, uh, but on the other hand, I own a bunch of regular cameras by Moultrie, and those are probably my favorite. Really? I love Moultrie, the regular cameras. Those are like 80 to to $100 range. Mm-hmm. They solid take cameras. Solid cameras. Yeah. Uh, most of them have – I still use the ones that I bought when I was 18, really? like almost 10 years ago, no and they're way. still working. So, Huh. That's cool. Yep. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up for today. I think we, yeah, we covered think so. a lot of topics, everything yeah. from hunting all four states in New England, uh, deer activity, all the all. It's been good. I think there's a lot to take away from this. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to the next one. Definitely stay tuned for some of the guests we have coming on in the next few podcasts. Uh, I think you're really going to like the people we're bringing on here soon. A lot of knowledge coming, a lot of tips you can take, um, a lot of good deer stories. So be ready for that. And uh, 
we'll keep the fire going here, get you guys through to uh, next year's season. But uh, we'll see you next time. See you later.